Hi, this is the Bud Rebel Show. This is Bud Rebel. Today, I have the honor of interviewing somebody who's a hero of mine, a person that is unbelievable. I've interviewed many actors, many celebrities, many people, and today is probably the most important guest I have had and may ever have on it. The gentleman is Mr. Sam Braden. He is a gentleman that survived the Holocaust, but we're going to take it in a different direction than the normal quote interview of people with the Holocaust because. What makes you a hero to me, Sam, is what you did afterwards. You went through some of the most, I mean, really, some of the horrible, most horrible things that a human being can go through. And yet you came out and you have, you had made a beautiful family that, that really is a, shows so much of what kind of person you are. And every time I see you, you're full of such kindness and love and faith, it just reminds me, I just don't know how you do it. So if you could first start out with something different, I'd like you to start out and tell me the day, if you can remember, the day that the Holocaust ended for the day that you were freed from the camps. Can you tell us a little about that, please? Well, you got my name when the war broke out, 1939, September 1st. I was 10 years old and I was a... Uh, in the school, I was a... Uh, my education was three years of elementary school. And that's when the war broke out in 1939. <clears throat> We're supposed to go to the fourth grade for Jewish children. We're not allowed to attend school at that time anymore. So my formal education was three years of elementary school. And that was it. Now I'm still thinking now that my Holocaust first started when I was 16. While everybody was returning for the war, the soldiers, uh, the concentration camps were being freed. I was 16 years old. When I was, in, when I was incarcerated, I was right uh, one year after my, my bar mitzvah, 14. And I went through Auschwitz, and I was liberated on May 1st, 1945, when I was 16. That was your 16th birthday, right? Well, I was 16, well, 16, 16th birthday. And at 16, I was the only one that survived for my whole family. I was the youngest of six siblings. Four sisters, one brother, and myself. At the age of 16, I survived. I looked around myself, there's nobody around me that survived to be able to support me while I came out after the concentration camp. Deadly sick at the time, but I wanted to live and I wanted to survive and to be able to retell the tragedy to all the people that happened, what happened during World War II. Dad, how much did you weigh when you... When, when I came out at 16 years of age, I weighed 65 pounds. So um, let me ask you a question. So were you liberated by the, uh, which troops were you that were you liberated by again? I was liberated by the British. So you liberated the British troops and, and like, and you, at that moment, what happens now? They just open up the camp. What actually happens to you at that moment? When, as much as you can tell us about at that moment when you're freed from this horrible. This, this it was May 1st, my birthday. That's when we were liberated. And people came in to tell us that we were liberated from the concentration camps. I didn't want to believe it. I thought there was a setup by the Nazis, by the Germans. I wanted to hear our reaction. But it wasn't so. It was true. Because the British tanks were pulling into the camps already. And we saw the British soldiers in their uniforms. And we first realized that we were liberated. So now, wait, I'm sorry. So you liberated. Does that mean all of a sudden, what do you do? Like, do they give you papers? Where do you go? What happens? I mean, it's only. How do you know? You said you have no family left. You have nothing. How do you know what to do, what, where to go, what to see? You know, what happens after that moment? 
We were liberated. We didn't know what to do. We finally realized that it was the truth that we were liberated. I knew I was 16 years old. I didn't know where to turn. All I knew that I was hungry and my only weight that I, that I had was 65 pounds. And I didn't know where to turn. We were hungry. We were looking for food. The British soldiers were ordered not to help us with much food because at that time we were unfed for so many months, practically years, that our stomachs were shrunken and they were told not to feed us regularly with food because our stomach would not be able to digest the food. So they tried very to feed us with very little food. And then we started complaining. Here we're liberated and we still don't get any food to eat. But that was the orders by the super British superiors not to feed us because they, were, they, they knew the situation we were in. We were undernourished for years. Our stomachs were shrunken and food would not be digestible. Oh, Sam, so now you're out of the camp, you're getting the first meals of food. This goes on for about weeks, months, how does this go on? For how long does it go on until you start like, eating regular food and get somewhat back to, I wouldn't say normal, but somewhat back to the stomach that you can digest food and back to that part? How long would you say that was like? Now, when we were liberated, they didn't know what to do with us. We we're all sick. Our weights were down to barely nothing. And they were afraid to feed us because they were threatened by the superior that if they feed us with food, we wouldn't be able to digest it and we'll die, which happened. Mm. Wow. Anybody that got hold of food and ate because they were hungry, they didn't care what kind of food it was and they didn't make it. I so, I'm sorry, so Sam, people even after the Holocaust, because their weight was so low, yes. they died after it by eating regular food because they couldn't yes. eat it. And there was people that you knew like that. Their food couldn't, wasn't digested. So this takes like weeks and weeks to get you back to your regular eating right. habits. And then after that, where do you go? Do you go, what happens next? Do you, I, you, I, from, your, from what I heard is that you went, I think you went to school in, in Sweden or Switzerland. Yes. So you all of a sudden- That comes after. That's yes. a, it's a continuation, I mean. Yes, I'm just getting a feel. I'm sorry, you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when we were liberated, there were no facilities in Germany because everybody was, all the buildings and all the hospitals were bombed. So the British command ordered to set up tents, field tents. It was already May, it was getting warmer, and they set up field tents, a field, uh, what do you call it, uh, tents, and set up s s sort of hospitals, put on beds, and so we can, we have place, we have pl a place where to lodge. That was May, end of May. End of May, the Swedish Red Cross announced that anybody would want to go to Sweden by the Red Cross and be taken care with their health conditions. Of course, we had no choice and I registered the beginning of June to go to Sweden. The Swedish Cross brought us into Sweden it took three days from Lubeck, Germany to transport us by ship to Helsingborg, Sweden. In Sweden, when we arrived by boat, we were greeted royally by the Swedish population, even with a band of music. But it wasn't the same band of music when we heard it when we were marching in Auschwitz to work in the morning. Six o'clock and returning six o'clock in the evening was a welcome 
march of music for us to arrive in Sweden. So now you're in Sweden. Now you're in Sweden. Now, if I remember correctly, you went to back, you went to school because you said you didn't get enough education. Well, not later. It's a, right. You, you didn't just go to school. Right. You, you were right. deadly sick. You right. You had to be brought right. back to life. Mm -hmm. and they're you understand? To, yes. It was in June, and they put us in Maple believe hospitals. In June, middle of June, the schools emptied out. They stopped going to school, and they set up the schools as quarantine for the people that survived. They made hospitals and they set up doctors to treat us. It was June and again, and they fed us with very little food. And we complained. You so we survived, you liberated us, and that's what you've given us. We are hungry. But they explained they cannot feed us full amounts of food because we will not make it, which a lot of people got hold of food and they don't, might not make it. Mm. It was June for three months. I was in quarantine where the Swedish Cross Cross set up the best doctors to treat us with the best medications. And they made sure that we get it in order to be brought back to life, to our health. It was the beginning of June already. By September, school start, started. And I was able to function already. I was already, already able to ride a bicycle. I was getting in better health than I was. So Sam, if I don't want to interrupt. Yes. You had met a lovely lady that became your wife. You met her, where did you meet her? That was way later. When I survived, I was 16, mm -hmm. and I met that beautiful lady, which I would have been six, married for 65 years now, mm -hmm. at the age of 25. Oh, that was when you came to the United States, I guess. So, so yes. you came, so how did you come to the United States? How did that come about? Well, we arrived on the, uh, the cattle cars to Auschwitz. In 1942, they made up a story that the Jewish population where I lived has to, has to be counted, which was a lie, because they had records and they knew how many Jews lived in that area. In 1942, they ordered us on a Monday, nine o'clock, to line up at the ball, at the ball field because you're going to be counted. My parents, myself, and, and the rest of the siblings did line up. And there wasn't a count. It was a setup. It was a segregation to be shipped to Auschwitz. There was a segregation. All the people were sent to the left. Children were sent with all the people to the left, which my parents were sent to the left, including myself. I was only 13, 14 years old. My older sister did not long leave the parents by themselves, so she volunteered to go along with them, including myself. When I came to the left side, I saw the surrounding of me, all the people and children, youngsters like myself. And I gave it a thought and I said, the situation is no good. All the people, all the people were considered in the 40s. My mother was 48 and my father was 53, 55. And I was the child plus my older sister, Hannah, she volunteered to accompany my, my parents. I looked around and I saw the situation is no good. Then all of a sudden, the gates of the ghetto opened up and truck with soldiers in full gear drove in into the ghetto, jumped off the trucks and they immediately set up 
about foot high machine guns because people were running away, like myself. I saw the situation is no good and I had to run away. I couldn't stay with my parents. So I grabbed, there was a pail, a white pail next to me. I grabbed the pail and assumed that I'm going to run for water. While the Germans, the SS set up machine guns as high as a foot high and they were contest, constantly thundering, shooting. So if people ran, they would be shut down and, and fall down. Some were hit, killed. I managed to run over to the site where my sisters and brother were. They were safe because they were in the 20s and they worked in a shop for the Germans where they were manufacturing uniforms for the German Air Force. So they were safe because they needed help to manufacture those uniforms. I managed to run over to the site of my sisters and brother and I was safe. I ran away from my parents. They didn't know what happened. But then, but then my parents were rounded up and they were marched to the railroad station where they loaded on buses and brought them to a next town called Benjamin and they were placed in a uh, what do you call it? Uh, children's uh, Orphan, orphanage. orphanage home and they were safe uh, what do you call it? place there. My sister Chaya, the next day, she went to that next town, Benjil. And my father looked out the window and he only was concerned about what happened to me. He told that I was shot down and I was killed. But she told them that I was home and I was safe and nothing happened to so me. I'm sorry, you came to America, if I remember correctly, reading about it, that you had a, an a uncle in the United States and he looked up your name in the New York Times or something like that and he came your name and he invited well, you that was to us have to, have yeah. to get to it, you know. Well, no, no, I just want to know about that. You come to, so you come, this horrible experience, you're coming to the United States, your uncle has you come yes. here. And now, how, you come to the United States by yourself still? Or you're, or you're by myself. You're, by yourself, all by, and you go on a boat to the United States. And when you first come to this, this country, the first thing you see is the Statue of Liberty. I mean, are you like, how are you like, are you overwhelmed when you come to this country? Well, that's happened later. Well, that's what I want to talk about. If we talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind. I want to know how you experience well, what that is. Well, that's happened later. If you could tell me just a little bit about that, please. Well, we arrived in Auschwitz in 1943. I arrived with my sisters and my brother. Because I, in 1942, I ran away and I was saved another year because my sisters and brother worked for the uniform company for the Germans on factories, Air Force uniforms. Now, when we, 1943, the war was going bad for the Germans and they wanted to find the solution of the Jews. In 1943, they decided they have to round up all the Jews from the area and send them off. Where? We didn't know. We assumed. We heard of Auschwitz, but we, we didn't know what it was. In 1943, we were all loaded. We were marched to the railroad station and loaded them to open uh, cattle cars. We were loaded to capacity. As many people I could stand. There was no sitting room. No water, no food, and no toilets. They pushed us into the cattle cars as many as we could. From our area to go to Auschwitz would take only half an hour to an hour. Instead, it took a whole day. That was in August of 1943. Bitter heat. 
There was a little opening in the cattle cars and we were all standing. There were no bathrooms, there was no food, there was no drinks. Finally, we arrived in the evening to Auschwitz. We are unloaded forcibly by being pulled out from the cattle cars by German dogs jumping on us and barking and shooting. We couldn't make it out of the cattle cars fast enough. We finally made it and we were sent to the right side with my sisters and my brother. And we only had a few minutes. And my sisters told us we were hoping that the war would eventually end, eventually end. And they told us, if you are to survive, we have to contact and named my mother's sister that lived in New York. Or we had to we can we had to survive to contact a cousin that went to Palestine in 1936. And I remember his name. And I knew he lived in Palestine at that time. So when they told me, I was the youngest, and they told me if we are to survive the war, we were hoping that we will survive. To contact my aunt in New York and my cousin Moshe in, in Palestine. So who did you call when you got this in? When I came to Sweden, I didn't have paper. I, I wrote a note on toilet paper with a pen and I wrote it to my aunt in New York. I remember her name and I remember that I lived in Brooklyn and all I knew was her name, Brooklyn, New York. Wow, all the time you remember the name and everything. Now at that time, if letters arrived to the United States from Holocaust survivors, the letters were directed to the New York Times mm. and the New York Times had daily listings of survivors that survived the camps looking for family in the United States. One of my cousins happened to read the New York Times and she saw, he saw my name looking for the family in New York. He brought up the newspaper, the Times, and showed it to them and immediately the next day they ran down to New York Times in order to be able to get in touch with me. I was, I was in Sweden already. Right away I got a note not to do anything. That eventually they want me to come to the United States. The family is willing to have me there and be able to give me a home as much as I can. In Sweden, I was 16 years old. I knew what they put me in the high school. I was tall enough already then to look like a 16 year old. And in school, they put me in front of a blackboard and they gave me three lines to add up. I didn't know how to add up the three lines because my formal education was three years of public school education. And I heard in the background when they gave me the three lines to add up that they were giggling and laughing and they thought that was some kind of stupid. At 16 I couldn't add up three lines. But the situation was so, such that the teachers in the class saw what was going on and they volunteered to tutor us after school. It was September. By December, by December I was already capable to be caught up with the kids in high school. How did, the, how did the kids treat you in Sweden? Did they know you were a Holocaust survivor at that time? Did they, they, were they, how were the people in Sweden as you were going? Well, through? in school, kids could be very cruel. Mm -hmm. The older people knew the situation. The teachers knew 
in what situation we were in. But the kids were unreal. Mm. They thought it was funny. They saw a tattoo on my arm. They were joking around. What did you do there? Did you have girls? Did you go out on dates? They were cruel. They didn't know. Right. The teachers saw what the situation was and they volunteered to tutor us after school till December. And in December, we were capable already to participate in the classes of high school. That's amazing. You got through in a few months what people got through eight things. It's, it's actually an amazing story how fast well, you Well, we went. were forced to learn. We right. know in what situation we were. Yeah. While in Sweden. And you don't speak, sorry, sorry, you don't speak, you didn't speak Swedish, did you? No, so but you learned, you have to learn. You learned you learn school. You learned no other language. You learned like five years of college in six months, I mean, in high school or whatever. All that, it's, it's an amazing amount of knowledge you learned very, we very We spoke quickly. German and a lot of people in Sweden spoke, spoke German. Okay. German. We made ourselves understand. That one in Sweden, I knew how to continue with school. What are we going to do? I signed up for vocational school to become a machinist, which they accepted me. I went to school from 45 to 49. My family invited me to come to the United States, and I refused mm. because I didn't know what was waiting in the United States for me. And I knew I had to learn a trade and I have to be self sufficient. Did I signed up for a uh, Trade school, become a machinist. After four years of school, I graduated and I got a call from the German consular, well, the American consular, that my family sent affidavits for me to come to the United States. And all the papers were ready for me. If I'm willing to go to the United States, I can leave Sweden within two weeks. I graduated school, I had the diploma, uh, the high school diploma uh, with, a, with a trade, with a, a machinist, and I called back to American consulate that I'm ready to come so, to the United States. During those four years, did you earn any, how did you survive income like? Did they give you any, did you have any money come out? Did you work anything? How did you survive? Bruce, it was a good question. First of all, the Swedish government gave us full support. They gave us stipends that we could live in an apartment. Of course, we joined with three other kids who were in the same situation as myself, and we rented an apartment. The Swedish government paid for it, and they gave us an allowance every week, so we had money for food and to be able to support ourselves. While the four years in Sweden, life was pretty good for us. Hmm. People were very friendly, very hospitable. If you walked in the street, people would approach us and invite us over for coffee and food. And it was, it was a terrific life while the four years in Sweden. In some way, the four years in Sweden were better than the years even before the Holocaust, because if I remember reading about it, the Polish people were very mean to the Jewish people, even before the Holocaust even happened, that the Swedish, your, your experience in Sweden was better than your youth, other than because your family, your loved ones. But the idea that people, the, the, the Polish people, were not really good to you before, as a young person, you didn't have any. It was a very difficult time to grow up as a young person there as well. Bruce, good question. The Swedish people were very hospitable, very good to us, and did whatever they could by feeding us, by taking us into an, an apartment store, and we, before they brought us into a to a washroom, to a, what do you call it? installation to be washed and cleaned up. And then that. after we were cleaned up, they drove us into an apartment store. And in the apartment store, we could pick two pieces of any item that we wanted. From clothing, from, I was thrilled 
when I was 16 and I could pick a shaving set. Wow. And that was my tree because I could shave already, but I didn't have what to shave with. But then I was given a shaving set. Gold color, looked like gold. And I was thrilled, th thrilled with that. I mean, you come out of the Holocaust, you have no clothes, really, other than what you wear, you have no nothing, you have no possessions at all. So now you come in Sweden, even if you have anything, you have like just a pair of clothes you got now. Right. Nothing. And they took us to an apartment store. So, you have, so now you come in the United States. And you maybe. could pick any, anything of two pieces, two pairs of shoes, two, two suits, two shirts, two everything. So you come and to the we United States. Yeah, you come to the United States, life. you have one bag maybe coming here. It's like yes. a long how you went on a boat and how I mean you first come here, you like uh, like just overwhelmed with the difference of life. I had a little suitcase with a few things. And of course, when I came to the United States, I was fully accepted with love, with everything that I wanted to. When I arrived, I didn't know who my family was, mm. but I saw a woman with a picture of me. Mm. Wow. So I could recognize who it was. Wow. So so they, they took you in, but you still had to get a job, right? You had to get everything all together and stuff like that, right? I mean, you do when I came to the United States, I was accepted by family. Everybody came to visit me. Cousins came. Uh, everybody gave me a present of a couple of dollars. So I have some money. They're very hospital. Now, that was in the United States already. But let me ask you a question, Sam. So, you, what did you do when you first got? What kind of did you, what did you, how did you get a job? You're still like, you know, you're still, what, 20 something years old. You never had a job before. You come to the country, you don't speak English probably. What job did you initially get? What was your first job in this country? Well, a job was still out. My family didn't want me to go to work immediately. Okay. They wanted me to stay on vacation, recuperate, be good. I did. But after two weeks, I was already retired sitting around. <laughs> I was 20 years old already, and I wanted, I looked at uh, the paper, and I saw there were openings for jobs, and I was already a machinist, and I got myself a job. The rate at that time was going 65 cents an hour to 75 cents an hour. I got a job, I accepted it because I wanted to get out of the house, and I want to be useful. Now, okay, the rest of the story is like almost any of different, of, and your story in immigrants of the past is, is similar, but your whole trauma of going through this whole thing, you're a remarkable person because you're so loving and caring, and people that go through such horrible, slightly horrible, they can be so hateful people. How do you, how are you so kind, honestly, with so much horror that you went through, and, and, you're, and, you're, and this man has such faith. And you went through such terrible things. You go through little things. How did you keep that? How did you and you? How did you keep that going? Even when the concentration camp Auschwitz, my desire to live was very strong. I never thought people were committing suicide. I never thought about committing suicide. I wanted to continue. I was with an older brother in the camp. He was five, seven years older than myself, and I knew if I survived. I'll have to support for my brother. My brother only lasted two days before liberation and he didn't make it. And he again. Now, until I got to all that, I lived through Poland. I was born in Poland. Poland, li Poland life was unbearable. When the war broke out, I was 10 years old, like I mentioned before. I was in the third grade elementary school. In Poland, anti-Semitism was rampant since I was a child. I was always called derogatory names, dirty names as a Jew. And the reason in Poland that was happening is the Polish population was very uneducated. 99% of the poor did, did not know how to write or read. And the only education they used to get is in the church. And in the church, they were always preaching anti-Semitism against the Jews. 
a two or three year old child knew how to yell derogatory names if they saw a Jew in the street. That was Poland. I remember distinctly on a Sunday, nine o'clock in the morning, they were preaching from the Holocaust by a very renowned priest preaching against the Jews, supporting anti-Semitism. But we were sitting and listening to the, pro the Polish program at nine o'clock in the morning. That was Poland all about, and I can continue forever. Even after the war, then we were liberated. While Poles were in the Auschwitz concentration camp, we were still, after we were liberated, we were still treated as Jews of Poland. Again, anti Semitism was rampant. And when you came to the, the Poles. When you came to the United States, you, did you find anti Semitism, or did you find that people were basically a different type of way about it anyway? When I came to the United States, to me everything was tranquil. I came to the Bronx, my, that's my uh, aunt lived there in the Bronx. Anybody here from the Bronx? I'm from the, I work yeah. in the Bronx, I'm in the Bronx. And they took me for a walk on Westchester Avenue. And on Westchester Avenue, they had stunts, fruit stunts. You remember? Ah, uh, that's before my all kinds of fruits. And I saw fruits that I never saw in my life. I saw cantaloupes, I didn't know what cantaloupes were. I saw peaches, I didn't know, I didn't see a peach in my life. And all those fruits. And I pinched myself, I said, am I dreaming or am I in the right to say to So my, my question is, you dealt with, my question is, how did you deal with this such horrible thing. I mean, did you have nightmares and night? How did you get over? You, you raised a lovely family. Every, I mean, the family is incredible. I mean, raising them and dealing like people have to go to psychologists and psychiatrists, like, small stuff. Did you have to go to counseling? Did you do any of that stuff? How did you deal with this horrible and move forward? How and because people right now are suffering from trauma from the from the coronavirus. What do you recommend for people like going through this? How were you able to keep going going forward when you know there were so many things that could have held you back? Basically. Bruce, you ask us some questions. I, at 16, or when I came to the United States, I was uh, 1820, and I never went to a psychologist or psychologist. I knew I had to bring out myself. I had to bring out. I lived positively that the future, that there's a future for me in the United States and I'll make it through, which I did. You, you actually owned your own business, correct? In the United States, you eventually made your own business here, correct? Afterwards. You had to, it took, took time. It took First time. I worked on the job, but there was an opportunity to go into business. And you weren't afraid. One of the things I, 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 I even when during the Holocaust, when people, you, they said a machinist, you jumped up and you said, I'm a machinist, even though you weren't a machinist. So you, you, always jump for the opportunity. Yes. You always said, I can do this and I'm going to do this. Exactly. And so you weren't afraid. Felt. And I built myself up. You were never afraid to, die, you know, they, you know, no. you always went for that. And I saw the United States as a great country and there's a lot of opportunities. And all I have to do, build myself up. No psychiatrist, no psychologist. I had to make a human being out of myself which I did. So when I worked on a job, I was making very little money, then a little more, and then I was given an opportunity to go into a business. And you did it, you just jumped right into it. Like yes. your first business without anything, you just jumped into, into the business. Into a dry cleaning business. Mm -hmm. For me, to get up from the job that I was making, Forty, fifty dollars a, a week. I got into a business where I was coming on with hundred and two hundred dollars a week. 
I couldn't believe it. <laughs> it was a change in my life. And I continued. It's, a, it's in the an, dry cleaning business. It's an incredible story. And I and what the reason it's so inspiring again is that we have such a people to understand what you were able to do with such a such little opportunities you had and making it so far is really inspiring. And I, I, I hope the viewers that watch this, we're all going for, through some tough times, but nothing like this man who's really is my hero. And I'm so happy today that I was able to interview Sam. I'm really happy I was able to interview because I hope the people that watch this know that you know you have to jump. You have to go and try it, even if it's scary. He wasn't afraid. And he, and he proved that you can go through the worst things in life and make a great success. Sam, I, again, I'm, I'm so happy that you joined us. I'm, I'm going to try to get this out to the world because you're an inspire, inspiration to us all. And I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. And again, do you, you want to say anything, do you want to say anything to people that are feeling blue, that are sad? You, during this time, can you just you want to leave with any note that you'd like to tell people? And I saw there was a lot of opportunity in the United States and I always jumped on it, you know? I had a high school diploma as a machinist, and I signed up to go to the Pratt Institute for Engineering, but I didn't last. Only one semester, because I was approached to go into business, and I figured business will do better for me than continue with schools. Maybe I was wrong. I should have continued and become somebody. You're definitely but somebody. I, you are somebody. You are a great provider. We as children growing up in the house never lacked anything. The best education, trips, college educations, you gave us everything and then some. You and mom did a beautiful job and so you know something? You are more than something and you have a legacy with grandchildren and great grandchildren. So don't put yourself down. You're the best of the best, Dad. You really, really are. On the contrary, I don't. I saw there was a, a lot of opportunity in the United States, and I jumped on everything. I did, and it succeeded. My only interest was in my life, that I make enough to make a living and to be able to support my family. I had a family immediately because of my background. I could not wait with their family. I had a family immediately. And, and whatever, whenever there was an opportunity, I jumped on it in order to make enough so my children could be supported and have everything. Continue schools. And at 16, and no, Billy graduated high school here, Spring Valley High. And he decided before that if he graduates high school, he wants to go to study in Israel. Israel, when he was in the 60s, was not very supportive to him because we had a friend, he used to go to Israel, he used to come back and talk, all talk about Israel. And Billy was very upset. All he talks about Israel, if I'll have a hot potato, I'll shove it in his mouth if he doesn't stop. But then, Billy decided at 16 to go on a trip, a trip to Israel. We sent him, we paid for it. He went to Israel with a group of people and he came back. And the minute he got off the plane, Kennedy, and he says, I want to go back to Israel. And when he graduated high school, Israel was ready for him. He signed up for the university in Jerusalem, and he went back to study in, in Jerusalem. We never held him back from doing that. In Israel, he felt like at home. The Yom Kippur War broke out, he volunteered to help out, and then he volunteered to a kibbutz with a lot of American children, a lot of American youth, and he joined the kibbutz. Kibbutz's name was Yahel. And when we came to visit, 
He introduced me to his commanding officer of the kibbutz and he says, with Bill, I'll go any place. <laughs> it was true. All right, um, sorry, I don't want to wrap. I just want to tell you, Bill, uh, uh, Sam, that it's been a pleasure having you and interviewing you on this day. As I said before, you are my hero. I want to know people out there that, you know, as I said before, the tough times that we are going through as a country and as a people, that Sam Braden should be an inspiration to us to show that we can get through it all and make a big difference. Thank you for all joining us. Thank you for being a, joining us on the Blood Rebel Show.